and on for our spiritual uh, food this afternoon. At school, I was always bored during religion classes. I thought that uh, the priest is a boring teacher of another material, uh, and God, too, who wants me to complete a couple of exercises, but nothing interesting. This is how Johannes Hartl recalls his childhood, who is a literary person, philosopher, and a father of four children. He didn't like to pray, he says in a, in a memoir. I was just standing there when one, once my father took to a holy mass, and uh, all of a sudden, just joining in the, the prayer of the community without any feeling whatsoever, uh, I felt afterwards that something had changed in me. Uh, I have found God even though I did nothing in order to reach to him. This is how he recalls his, uh, the turn, turning point in his uh, faith. And after that, with his wife, they founded uh, Gibet's house, the uh, house of prayer, where uh, there is 24 hours prayer going on all the time. So please welcome Johannes Hartl. Good afternoon. What a joy to be with you all. Let me just start with a short prayer. Holy Spirit, we invite you to open up our ears to make us receive from God. Come with your wisdom and your clarity. Reveal Jesus in a deeper way to our hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So good to be with you. It's a real privilege and honor to be here, especially to be one of the few Germans here. I feel like I'm the only one. Any, anybody else from Germany here? Right. Yeah. So this afternoon, I'm going to share a story of hope. It's very personal to me, and I know if you hear something from Germany and hope, that doesn't go together well, right? Because normally if it comes about faith and church, you think from Germany, I mean, in Germany people aren't believing so much anymore, right? When I went to Poland some years ago, I was reported, I was interviewed by a Catholic newspaper. And the first question was, aha, uh -huh, you're from Germany. Can anything good come from Germany? That was the first question. Yeah, I have good news for you. In the Old Testament, God spoke through a donkey. So God can all, he can even use Germans to do something, right? But... <laughs> because I'm going to share a part of my, of my personal experience of my story. But to disappoint all of you, I'm not even a real German, because my grandmother was Hungarian. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, she didn't teach me any Hungarian, with one exception. There's one thing I learned. Pay attention. Who's from Hungary here? Okay. Gera kecska gombocska. Okay. This is this is the only Hungarian I know. Cousin um, <laughs> Egan. So, this afternoon, I'm going to speak about beauty, and I called this message the fascination of beauty. Maybe we can have that on the screen. Thank you. I'm going to speak about the fascination of beauty. I, it, was, it was good. I didn't understand the introduction because that was in Hungarian, so no idea what they said about me. I don't know even if it's true. But 
just some, some things about me personal. I'm Johannes, 42 years old. I'm married, one wife, four kids. Uh, yeah. So that's what they look like. The big one, the big one is my wife. The smaller ones are the kids, right? So yeah, that's my wife. And some years ago, my wife and I started something special. I was at university, and then we had the impression we are supposed to found, start a house of prayer. So what is a house of prayer? Well, it is a house. This is the house um, that used to be a fitness studio. So we bought it, and now it's a different kind of a fitness studio. Different kind of fitness taking place there. I'll just tell you some things about the House of Prayer. The main place, the main room in the House of Prayer is the prayer room. It's not a very big room. It seats maybe 100 people. Sometimes there are many people, sometimes there is only a handful, but this is not the special thing about that prayer room. The special thing is that it never stops. So if you go there in the afternoon at 3, you have a group of people praying. You go there in the morning at 8, you have a group of people praying. If you go there 3 o'clock in the night, you have a group of people praying. Next Saturday, we're going to celebrate a very special date because this will be our 10th anniversary of non-stop prayer. So, <laughs> so we, have a, we have a prayer group that is, has, has been going on for around 100,000 hours now. And it's special for us, especially that during the night and in the morning at the 365 days a year, prayer never stops, and it's mainly young people who do this. It's Christians from different denominations, so this is an ecumenical expression. We do at our conferences, for example, also have Eucharist adoration, but our main expression in the prayer room is a very free floating form of prayer with worship and music in this ecumenical, spontaneous style. And then we have some guest rooms and seminar rooms and things, and we even have a beautiful oratory, a chapel. And if you think about it, okay, you have a group of young people in Germany praying at 4 a.m. in the morning. You could say to yourself, who cares? I mean, who's interested in that? It's just five or ten people praying. So more than ten years ago, we thought, well, probably it, it's, it's going to stay hidden and small, like a small, like a hermit on the mountain or something like that. And then we had our first conference. We just invited friends who wanted to know about what we're doing, and 100 20 people showed up. We were so overwhelmed. So many people. 120. And then next year, the same conference, a prayer conference. Conference about prayer. It was 250 people coming. And one year later, it was 1,000 people coming. And we couldn't explain it. So our little, small, tiny House of Prayer prayer conference, some years later, looked like this. Um, and it was 3,000 people. And our little House of Prayer prayer conference, some years later, looked like this. And the last time we did it, last year, it looked like this, and we had 12,000 people in Germany. Um, (Applause) 
I'm not telling that to brag or to say, oh, isn't that cool to have 12,000 people? That's not the main thing. But I ask myself the question, what is the secret behind that? How is that possible? What can we learn? And this afternoon, I want to share five principles with you that I have learned about basically how to do church, how to live a Christian life, especially in a country like Germany, which is very secular. And these are five elements or five lessons that I personally have drawn from this story. Actually, I love this picture very much because this picture was taken by a TV studio and it was broadcasted in German mainstream secular news. It was 6 p.m. or 8 p.m., like the biggest news show, and they had the title of the conference was Holy Fascination. Yeah? And the news, the news story had the very same title as a headline. It says, said, Holy Fascination, 10,000 Christians gather. And they brought that very picture in the news. And I loved the fact that Christians were known for fascination because oftentimes we, as Catholics, we are known for what we are against. As a Catholic, you are against this, you are against this, you are against this. And that's okay, but I dream of a church who's known for her fascination. What are we burning for? Not what we are against. What we are fascinated for. <laughs> the world is filled with negativity and with different groups fighting against other groups. And then you have the Christians, they also have their little fight. But who are people who are burning with fascination? I think this is important. So, maybe you say, well, fascination, this is not a real biblical term. No, nowhere in the Bible you find the word fascination. I do believe the New Testament, the Old Testament as well, the New Testament is filled with the concept of fascination. They just use other, uh, other, other words. Just when Peter and John are interrogated at the court in Jerusalem, they try to silence them. They say, you're not longer allowed to preach. This is what they answer. But Peter and John replied, whether it is right before God to obey you rather than God, you decide. For it is impossible for us not to speak about what we have seen and what we have heard. So John and Paul, they don't say, oh, we, you know, we've studied theology, so we have to speak about theology. This is our job. No, they were fascinated. They said, we cannot be silent. The same thing when, when, when people encountered Jesus. They couldn't turn away their eyes. My first point is, fascination is at the center of the Christian life. It is a central topic. Are we fascinated for Jesus? See, there are, there are some funny stories in the gospel. <laughs> for example, once there is some, some policeman actually sent to arrest Jesus, right? They come and they want to arrest Jesus. But then they come back and they have not arrested Jesus. So they get asked, so why didn't you arrest Jesus? And they say, no man has ever spoken like this man. See, even his enemies couldn't help but be fascinated by him. There is a beautiful TV show coming right now into Europe. It's called The Chosen. Anybody heard about The Chosen? 
You have to check it out. It's, it's a great, it's a TV series, like Netflix, about the life of Jesus. And it's done so perfectly, because you see, Jesus was not, he wasn't this boring guy, preaching, you know, na, na, na. you know, he was a fascinating personality. This is the chosen. You have to check it out. It's, it's, it's really, it's, it's very good. Fascination is supposed to be at the core of the Christian life. It's so important. The gospel is not primarily about what you do, but it's primarily who you love. I'm going to come back to this point at the second point. So, why is that? Why is fascination so important? It is so important because it's the way us humans are made. Why is it that only we humans create arts? Only we create music. The elephant does not compose anything. Neither the zebra. They don't paint. They don't dance, they don't write novels, they don't play drama, they don't compose music. It's only humans who do that. We have a desire for this. The oldest monuments of human mankind were already beautiful adorned. This temple in Egypt was built something like 2000 before Christ, and it's it's carved with the most beautiful patterns. Humans have created beautiful places, beautiful buildings like this. This is, uh, is Saint-Chapelle in, in, in Paris. Because there is something in our heart that longs for beauty and fascination. And there is a reason why this is. Why is it humans have this longing in their heart. Now, we're doing a little bit theology now, but we do it with pictures, so it's easier. So, if you look at creation, if you look at nature, one very interesting thing is the fact that it is filled with beauty. Wherever you go, like, for example, this picture. Have a guess. Where is this? What country could this be? Yeah, that's, that's Ireland, Northern Ireland. Or this, you know, it's, this is Switzerland. It's interesting, wherever you look, you have different forms of beautiful land, landscapes. This, of course, it's very green, you have a lot of water, this is beautiful. But even the desert can be very beautiful. Look at this picture. This is dramatic. It's very beautiful. Or think about the ocean. If I would ask you, where is the ocean the most beautiful? What would you answer? Yeah, a, a true Hungarian would answer in Hungary. Yeah, but just kidding. <laughs> the ocean is beautiful wherever in, 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 in England. The ocean is beautiful in the southern seas. I, I show you one picture where I actually, where I once was. I once was there. This is in Seychelles Islands. This is very beautiful. But the ocean even is beautiful when it's frozen, like here. This is in Iceland, and it's also very beautiful. It's very difficult to find a spot on the ocean that, that it's, which is not beautiful. Or think about flowers. Right? Which flower is the most beautiful one? Let's take. Is this flower more beautiful or this? Which one? Well, they're all beautiful, right? Yeah, I mean, okay, okay. Here comes the biologists. And the biologists say, you know, this flower is only beautiful to attract the bees, because the bees 
sees the beautiful flower, and you know, the bees and the flowers, you know, they come together and they produce little flowers, you know. Okay. So this is how they explain it. Yeah, that's partially true. Because there are many beautiful parts in nature where there are no bees and no flowers and no procreation at all. If you take a space telescope and you watch the sky at night, there are stars out there that look like this. There is never ever a bee coming around any of those stars. Nothing procreating up there, but it's incredibly beautiful. It's interesting, nature is filled with beauty. If you walk around, let's say, in the forest, and you somewhere see something ugly, probably humans have thrown it there, or have built it there, because normally nature is beautiful. It is interesting, right? If God creates something, it looks like this. If humans create something, it sometimes looks like this. So what's the difference? Well, God created beauty. Why do we as humans have a desire for fascination? Simple answer, because God is fascinating. We wouldn't thirst if there was no water. The fact that we as humans thirst proves that water exists. Human beings have a deep desire for fascination because the source of the universe, of everything, He Himself, the Creator, is the essence of beauty and fascination. And friends, we have to speak about that. Because this is central to the gospel. Let's jump to a Bible verse, which probably is unfamiliar to you. It's not a very famous Bible verse. It is a part of the first letter to Timothy. And it's just a small phrase. Paul writes, I say this and this, according to the gospel of the glory of the blessed God. Okay. According to the gospel of the glory of the blessed God. This is in Hungarian. A boldog isten solo evangelium la Yeah, you can read it here. So, this is a small phrase, but I find it very interesting. So, Paul says, I am preaching the gospel of the glory of the blessed God. What does that mean? This is glory and blessed and gospel. This is religious language. This is like Gloria, Hosanna, Amen. So, I, I translate it for you, yeah? First of all, Paul says, the gospel that I'm preaching, the message, is a message about God. It's not a message about humans. It's the gospel of the glory of the blessed God. And now two qualifiers, two characteristics of God. First, he says, it's the glory of God, and second, the blessed God. I'll help you a little bit. Glory in the Greek doxa means something like radiant. This is not church language. Paul is not using church language, he's using normal language. So glory is something like you see the sun and you say, Wow, 
This is pride. And Paul says, God is like this. God is glorious. God is beautiful. And then the second thing is the glory of the blessed God. What is blessed? Blessed is like holy or like a little bit below holy. Again, 1 Timothy doesn't use religious Greek. He uses normal Greek. And the normal Greek word is makarios. And makarios means happy. Happy, joyful. What the writer says here is God is beautiful and God is joyful. And this is our message. And I'm a theologian and our charism is to come up with difficult words for simple things. All right? So, here is a difficult word, word for a simple thing. I call that theocentric. What is theocentric? Theocentric means God is in the center. Friends, we have to put God back in the center of our message. Because Paul says, my gospel is the gospel of the glory of the blessed God. Honestly, I, I go to church a lot. I heard many sermons in my life. But so many sermons are about human beings. They are about what you have to do, what you're not supposed to do, about who says what and who said what, and what we are for and what we are against. But the central part of the gospel actually is the, is the most central question in the life of every human being. And this is the question, who is God? Who is God? As church, do we speak about God? Or do we speak about all other topics? And if we speak about God, do we speak about Him like Paul, that he's joyful, that he's beautiful, that he's fascinating. The central truth of the gospel is not that you have to be a good person. This is not the gospel at all. The central part of the gospel is not go to church on Sundays and don't commit adultery. It's a good thing to not commit adultery and to go to Mass on Sunday, but this is not the main thing. It is a message about who God is. Therefore, I love the fact that here in the Eucharist Congress, we take a week to speak about Jesus, to put who Jesus is, to put the Eucharist in the center, because the Christian life centers around Him is centered around who God is. If you ask me why do our people pray day and night, we have around 50 full-time staff members. Why is it that they do it, what they do? The answer is they have understood that He is worthy, that He is worthy to be loved, to be praised. So we take a lot of time on our conferences, in our meetings, to speak about Jesus, to speak about God, to put Him first. It is more important that you know Him, that you love Him, than all the things that you have to do. He's really good. He's really loving. He really wants to get to know you. Second point. Third point. We need rooms. We need places where people can encounter 
this God. Rooms. Something like that conference that I showed you. People need places where we can say, come and see, right? There are so many books written. But we need rooms where you can encounter fascination, where you can encounter Jesus. I show you some pictures. This is a skincare shop, a skincare shop in Germany. It's skincare. You can you can buy creams and shampoos and stuff. So, look at this. Look at this shop first. Would you want to go there? I personally, I would say yes, it looks nice. It looks welcoming. It's beautifully decorated. You know what I find interesting? It's full of religious symbolism. It's called rituals. I mean, this is a very Catholic word. Rituale Romanum. Rituals. And then you have somebody with praying hands. You know, she's, she's, she's doing it like this, right? And then, of course, you have, you have other symbols like the, the statue. It's not Christian, right? It's more Asian or, or Buddhist. But it's, it's full of religious symbolism. And you know what drives me a little bit crazy is our Christian churches and our Christian meetings oftentimes don't look so warm and so friendly as this shop. Or think about this party. This is a party somewhere in Germany, young people. If you see that, you would say, wow, they are having fun. They, they are joyful and it's a party, it's a celebration. Why is it so many of our church and Christian gatherings, they're like sober, a little bit boring, not so beautiful, not so welcoming. By the way, I'm not saying that here because all the stuff, all the volunteers, you're doing an amazing job. You're so friendly. This is... But if we are fascinated by Jesus, our meetings, our seminars, our conferences, our church services have to look like Jesus. And this is being welcoming. Have, have an open heart. Make it easy for people who are outsiders to come. I love the fact that a good percentage of the people who come to our conference are people who are not yet Christians. I love it. These are the most important people. We have to build rooms that make it easy for people who are not part of the family to become part of the family because this is what Jesus did all the time. He celebrated parties with unbelievers. This is what Jesus did. So we have to create rooms and organizations and places and gatherings that make it easy for people who don't believe to experience fascination. If this is true, if God is beautiful, if Jesus is fascinating, and if us humans, we have a desire for fascination, the fourth point, 
<laughs> has something to do with beauty. And for this, I have to tell you a funny story, which is actually not funny, but it's very sad. But it's a good story. A friend of mine used to be a barkeeper. He was not Christian. He was working at a very exclusive, very expensive bar at the beach. And all the rich and famous people, they went there, they drank champagne, snorted cocaine, and did things what rich and famous people do. And my friend was in the middle of that, yeah, having party and drinking all the years. And eventually he hit a, a, a life crisis. His life broke down and he started to question. He started to look around. And he actually became Christian. He became Catholic. He converted. And then he left his former job, his career, and he was looking around. He asked himself maybe, is he called to be a priest? Or he had different things. And he went to different seminars and, and monasteries and retreats and gatherings and all of that. And after two years, we met. And he asked me a question that to this day hurts me. He said, Johannes, you Christians, you talk about beauty. How wonderful God is and how the creation is and about love and grace and Gloria and Hosanna. But he said, Johannes, I ask you a question. For two years now, I go to all the Christian houses and retreat centers and meetings. All my friends from my former life, they have their restaurants, they have their bars and their hotels. Their life is meaningless. They drink champagne and snort cocaine. But when they open a restaurant, it's beautiful. If they open a bar, it's highest quality. If they open a hotel, the personnel is super friendly. Everybody is welcoming and it's, everything is done with love for detail. A little bit like this. And he said, Johannes, you Christians speak about beauty and speak about God, but then I come to your retreat houses. The food is not good. The floor is dark blue plastic. And the wall is gray. And it all looks like it was built in 1951. And then the personnel is not even friendly. And then it's not even particularly cheap. So what's wrong with you? I don't have an answer for that question, but I travel a lot in Christian retreat houses, and it's true. Something's wrong. I mean, it's interesting. It's not just with us Christians, you know? <laughs> but in Germany, there was a ranking done, a ranking what is the most ugly, the ugliest university? The ugliest. You want to see the ugliest German university? That's the ugliest German university. You know what strikes me the most? I show you a picture how universities looked like in the Middle Ages. In the 14th century, Universities looked like this, or looked like this. I believe that as a society, we have lost beauty. And oftentimes, as a church, 
two. Everything needs to be cheap. Everything needs to be simple. Everything needs to be just minimum. What have we lost? I can tell you what we've lost. Fascination. Because if you're fascinated, if you are in love with a girl, you don't buy the cheap flower for eight forint. You buy the beautiful bunch of flowers. Right? Love wants to give. And love creates beautiful things. This is why God created everything beautiful, because He's love. And I don't believe in a love that doesn't show itself. If we truly love Jesus, we have to take beauty seriously. We need beauty back. We need beautiful music. We need beautiful architecture. And don't, don't, tell me, don't tell me, Johannes, but this is all so expensive. No, it's not always so expensive. Beauty is not always a matter of money, but it is always a matter of love. And the ugly thing is not always the cheapest. The ugly thing is just nobody cared. You know, whatever. You know? I tell you a very sad thing, but it's true. When we do our conference, so this is... Again, I'm not bragging about that. I don't care. It's, it's not the thing, oh, look, what a great conference. This is nonsense. But there's a deeper meaning behind that. Yeah? Love wants to express itself. If we do this conference, I hire non-Christians to do the lighting, the sound, and the design. I do it with non-Christians. You know why? Because they do a better job. Because the Christians say, ah, this is for the church, okay. Ah, it's for the church. You know what? I do it for free, but it will be low quality. And I say, no, thank you. It is for God. Therefore, it is supposed to be beautiful. And then you have the non-Christians who do this. And I say, what? You do all of this for, for, for God? And then we have the guy behind the production, the FOH, you know, this production panel or somewhere backstage doing his tech thing during our conference. And suddenly you see him sitting there crying. He cries. He cries. And he says, I... It's a true story. He said, suddenly I understand. Somebody asked him, what do you suddenly understand? He said, suddenly I understand why Jesus died for us. This is a non-Christian light technician. And he sees this beauty and he is touched by beauty. I tell you something. This generation, especially in the West, is not interested in truth so much. It's not interested in morals, but they are very, very sensitive to beauty. And I'm not speaking about the outward beauty. It's not, oh, we're all going to have makeup and all have funny jackets, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about something else. They check you and they feel if this is authentic or not. If there is a deeper beauty. If, this, if the outward appearance matches the inner reality. And if they see that it is authentic, they will want more because the human heart has a desire for God, has a desire for Jesus, and Jesus really is the answer. So we have to take beauty seriously. The fifth and the last point. I showed you big pictures 
about conferences and many people. But all of this comes from here. This is not a big conference. This is just a prayer room. And sometimes it's only one person. Sometimes only two. Sometimes only three. But it is all born from prayer. And this is where everything starts. This now is a famous Bible verse, but one we forget. I, I, for, I Johannes Hartl, I forget it too often. I need to repent. I need to come back to that over and over. Jesus speaks about fruitfulness. Fruitfulness is the multiplication of life. Fruitfulness is not many people in a conference. Many people in a conference can be here today and gone tomorrow. This is not what I'm speaking about. Fruitfulness is procreation, the giving of life, and life again, and life again. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I am him bears much fruit. Hmm. First of all, I love the fact it says much fruit. So, the Father wants us to bear much fruit. Much. I say that because there are some Christians who believe I just do my job in faithfulness day to day and I want to stay hidden. Yeah, but the Father wants you to be fruitful. He wants you to bear much fruit. But then, because apart from me, you can accomplish nothing. This last word is very fascinating in Greek because if you read the original Greek, and for this word nothing, there is a Greek word that means nothing. It's very interesting. So, Jesus says, if you don't stay closely connected to me, all activity that you do may look great, but will not produce fruit. I have it in Hungarian too. So abiding in Jesus is impossible without putting prayer first. Prayer first. Prayer is not the only secret in the Christian life, but it's the one fought against most. Prayer is not everything, but everything is nothing without prayer. And I don't care how exactly is it that you pray. Find your own rhythm. Find your own pattern. Find your own style. Find your own love language with God. But only if we set prayer first, we will see fruitfulness. I showed you great pictures about big conferences, but we didn't start there. I will know I will now show you the room where we started. Our first prayer sessions, our first prayer room is this. This is where it started. One person, two persons, four hours every day. 
for many, many years. We like the big stories, we like the success stories, but all fruitfulness in the kingdom of God flows from the inside out, from the inside out. Our world is busy with the outside. And honestly, I love the outside too because I want to reach people, right? I want the world to be reached. But fruitfulness starts from the place of intimacy with Jesus, starts from the place of prayer. Dear friends, I believe this is a special time for the Catholic Church. It's not an easy time, especially not for us in Europe or in Germany. But every crisis of the church always has brought about a separation, has brought about a crisis. In the Greek, crisis means discernment. Some things will die and other things will be born. And sometimes old things have to die so that new things can be born. I believe that something new is born if we start to rediscover the fascination of knowing Jesus. Maybe you personally, maybe you realize my religious life is filled with things and things and things. Yes, but do you know Jesus? Do you love Him? Is your heart still burning for Him? And if not, come back. This is the most important question. See, I'm married. If I, if I ask my wife, all right, how often do I have to kiss you today? It's a strange question to ask, right? If I don't want her to kiss her. I have to ask the question, where is my heart? Do I love her? And if not, what has come between us? It's the same with Jesus. The question is not, how much do I have to pray? How often do I have to go to communion? or whatever? It's not the question. The question is, where is your heart? And if your heart is not burning for Jesus anymore, which is normal because we lose our fire, don't condemn yourself. It's normal from time to time to lose your fire. I have lost my fire many times. But you don't have to stay there. You come back. You come back to the first love. And if we start, even as a church, to come back to the first love, to put God back in the center and not us, our ideas and what we have to do and all our but God, who He is. Fruitfulness will eventually come again. But it's a way to go. It's, it's, sometimes, it's funny, after a Mass, after a service, I hear Christians, I hear Catholics talk to each other. Well, the organ player today, he was not so good, right? And the sermon, I didn't like the sermon, huh? But the choir, the choir was good. Yeah, the choir was very good. What well, the choir was good, yeah. And the flowers, oh, the flowers, they were very beautiful on the altar. Yeah, but this new song, I didn't like this new song. And we only speak about ourselves. What we like, what our expectations are. Okay? I wish for some Catholics together around after Mass and ask, ask them a question. Do you believe God liked today's service? Do you believe that He felt welcome? Do you believe that He felt loved? 
This is the main question. You know, and if somebody goes to the organ player and says, this new song, I didn't like this new song. You know what the organ player should answer? Oh, you didn't like the new song. No problem. We weren't singing it to you. There is something beautiful in the way we worship Jesus that is lost if we, if we focus on ourselves, if we focus around what we want. You know. It's like kissing. If you kiss, you don't think about your mouth. <laughs> you forget yourself. You love the other person. If you're in a concert, you're not sitting in a concert and thinking about your stomach. Oh, how is my stomach feeling? How is my eye feeling? This is nonsense. You are paranoid if you do that. If you are sitting in a concert, you think about the music. You are all ear. You're like, wow, this is worship. This is what worship does. Worship is you get lost. This is what adoration is. You get lost in wonder. And if we create rooms where people can experience that, if we fill those rooms with beauty, with music, and not just with superficial beauty, but with a heartfelt, authentic, warm, welcoming atmosphere, and if we prioritize prayer in our life, especially if you are active in the church, fruitfulness will come. One last remark for those among you who are active in the church. Who is active in the church, being in, in any ministry at all? Who is active in the church? Okay. As a volunteer, as a lay person, as a priest, as a religious whatever. One last remark. The service for, of the, for the Lord can become your Lord. Serving God can become your God. And that's a danger. God is more important than the service. You need time for God alone. Otherwise, your service will be become your master and your Lord and your God. But your service, your ministry is not your God. You were created by a loving, beautiful God for a beautiful love relationship with this God. And if you live this, and if you testify this, there will be a fascination that will speak about His beauty. And people will come and see, and the church that lives like that will be attractive. Even for Germans <laughs> or other nations. I would, I would like to end with a short prayer. So maybe, may I suggest that we stand up? If you want to know more about the things that I do, you find a lot on the internet, on social media, and on YouTube and books and stuff. That's very easy. Um, let's just maybe close our eyes. And just for a moment, Focus on, focus on Jesus. You don't have to 
picture him like a person, but just open your perception, your heart, for his presence. He's already there. He's waiting for you. And if there is one thing that struck you this afternoon, make it a prayer. Maybe it struck you that maybe you have lost your first love. Or it struck you that he is beautiful. Or it struck you that all fruitfulness comes from prayer. Make this your prayer and say to him, Lord, I'm coming back. Lord, I'm coming back to the place of first love. Lord, teach me anew how to pray. Just use your own words. Just be honest. You don't have to follow a formula. You can be yourself. Holy Spirit, I invite you to now fill this, fill this room and touch our hearts with fresh love for Jesus. Draw us deeper into community with him. Make us fruitful and renew your church so that the world will say, come and see, and we'll be fascinated for Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.